Welcome to How to Be a Money Magpie, the podcast from moneymagpie.com. I'm Jasmine Bertles, the founder of Money Magpie, and this podcast series looks at all sorts of aspects of money, from clearing clutter to cryptocurrencies, and from bargains to buy to let. Today, we're looking at ESG investments, environment, society, governance, something that you'll have seen all over the place, of course. You might even have heard about it at work, at least the ESG bit, and then, you know, wondering what it means. It's a buzzword that people keep using. And when it comes to investing, it's almost as hot a topic as Bitcoin. So I've brought in a couple of people to talk through what ESG really is and whether and how you should put your money into it. So hello first to Tom McGillicuddy from the app Ticker, which automatically invests your money into ESG products. Hello, Tom. Hi, thanks for having me. Great. And also to Rob Morgan from Charles Stanley Investment House, which offers all kinds of ESG products among the huge number of investment in-house on their platform. Hello, Rob. Hi, thanks for having me on. Great. Well, it's nice to have both of you. I thought it'd be interesting to have two guys who are doing something similar, but not quite the same. So let, let's start with Tom, because this is essentially what what you do with Ticker, isn't it? What What's your view of ESG? Yeah, well, I think what we do is we incorporate ESG principles and then we go a further step. So I worked for eight years in the investment management industry before founding Ticker. And the last four years, I worked for an impact investment fund specifically. And that is about making investments into companies whose business model is designed to address one of the world's big social or environmental issues. And when we were investing that way, and this is how we do it at Ticker today too, we incorporate ESG principles into our impact investments and by ESG principles what I mean is is the company a good corporate citizen how well run is it how does it treat its employees how does it think about its supply chain how does it think about its own impact on the world through its operations basically and how it's used in the investment industry a lot is to think about risk mitigation and risk factors so people will look at the E S and the G factors in assessing if a company is going to be exposed to any of those risks in the future so that's the ESG element of how we how we do things and then we we try and go a further step, which is by investing in companies who are outright trying to solve some kind of social or environmental problem. For example, investing in a wind turbine business. And for us, we think these two things combined are key ways to engage a new audience to invest for the first time. You know, 90% of our customers at Ticker have never invested before. And we think that the kind of feel good narrative story of ESG and impact is the way to actually get people to adopt investing because they understand it, it means something to them, and they can feel good about it while they're doing it at the same time. And that in itself could be a, a way to retain them and get them to adopt good investment behaviors. Yeah, that's the thought. So, so Rob, I would imagine that 90% of your investors are not first-time investors at, at Charles Stanley, are they? No, I'd say the reverse is probably true, that 90% are, are existing investors. But I would say they're keen to learn. My experience is that this is of interest to all investors. And I mean, ESG itself, I would say, is a kind of process in terms of the context that a company is in. So the environmental impact it has, the social impact it has, and the, and the governance of the structures of that company. But the end result of using that process is what's important. So just because a fund uses an ESG process or says it uses an ESG process doesn't mean it's making a difference. So that bit comes in terms of the actual application of the process and what is actually being done. Because, mm. I mean, Tom, I would have thought that, say, for example, people thought, oh, I, I will put my money into pharmaceuticals because, you know, they're doing great things with their drugs. And then you have a, a huge number of court cases, for example, um, uh, because of one or two drugs. Surely that's that's quite a big risk. Is that something that you would consider when it comes to investing in pharmaceuticals, for example? Would, would they come under ESG? For people who are investing for the first time or who are experienced, I think it's it's clear that you can, we can get confused by what these different industry definitions mean. And I think the reason why I kind of separate the two, but they are linked, is because ESG is used 
as a risk assessment framework, but actually consumers, what they're trying to do when they fit, when they say ESG is they want to invest in companies that are outright good for the world, and that's impact investing. I just don't think most people are aware of mm. the vocabulary and definitions to use. And I think what we've seen a lot is if people want impact investments, but I've only heard the term ESG, when they look at an ESG only fund, they are often surprised at some of the holdings in that fund. For example, if you have an ESG only fund, you could have Coca-Cola and HSB as the top two holdings. But when people say ESG, what they mean more is, you know, electric cars and uh, wind turbine companies. And that's impact. And I think that distinction is going to become mm more and more clear as the years go by. And I think consumers actually want impact when they say ESG. Rob, we, we haven't really used the word ethical so much recently. We used to talk about ethical funds more, but you could have two types. You could either have those that don't do X, Y and Z, or you could have funds where they do, do and, and really rather like Tom said, sort of more impactful. You know, once you drill down, as you say, you could have Coca-Cola because I mean, I don't know, maybe they treat their workers very well and maybe they do this, that and the other that's that's good. But, you know, you might not consider that their product is particularly good for the country or good for individuals. So how would you say people who put these funds together really do look at is Is it really just from, a, if you like, negative point of view that, that they're not actually harming in in these various different areas? Well, I think the direction of travel is definitely towards the positive. If you go back in time, sort of 10 years, ethical funds, by which I mean kind of more focus on the negative and, and more focus on the exclusions, I, what, what doesn't go into the fund, you know, they, they were kind of your only options, really. But now we know more about what companies are actually doing and the impact they're actually having. So rather than taking a crude process of just saying, OK, I don't want to invest in X, Y, Z, you're actually saying, OK, well, I do want to invest in this, this and this. And that what they're doing is actually measurable as well. So we can actually have a tangible impact. And that's where the notion of impact investing actually comes in. So I think what's changed there is the level of the data. And also there's there's obviously a growing interest in the area. So I think it is a case that people are taking the opportunity to migrate their sort of portfolios into this space, even if there aren't certain new investors as well. And Tom, I'm, I'm wondering, do you have people who would really only care about the E part, the, you know, the, the environmental, or they'd only care about the governance part, perhaps? Are there funds that are just an E or just a G, or is it generally a mix of, of all three? Yeah, there's three main themes that we offer on the ticker platform. And the first one is people, which I suppose you could say is more of the S. And then planet is exclusively the E. And then people and planet together. The most popular is the combination of both and then followed by planet as an outright individual theme. The G element of all this has, has been part of good investment analysis for decades. I think that's the most well-established one. And the E and the S, having the scrutiny on them and getting more well understood. So I would say amongst our customers, it's a good split between the E and the S with a slight weighting towards the E. Mm, interesting. Do you find that as well, Rob? Is, is it basically, if people have a choice, is it environment that they would rather invest in or, or is it people? Yeah, I mean, I think those are probably the most emotive issues. So when people are thinking about these types of investments, I think that's foremost in their minds in a lot of cases. But just to re-echo what Tom said, actually, about the, the governance, you probably wouldn't want to put your money with a manager who doesn't take account of, of good governance in a company. So it should be a given, but you can't have a good E and good S without good G. So the three are linked together. What really bothers me, there are two things that bother me about ESG every time I see it, is firstly, the potential for greenwashing. And I'm sure you must have come across this, you know, there must be funds where whoever's running it is just basically pretending, you know, and, and you, if you drill down, you find this isn't. Have you found this? Yeah, and there's been a lot of rebranding of funds that already existed with the words sustainable and ESG thrown on the front of them in the not too recent past. And I think the best thing for retail investors or anybody who's assessing a fund is just look at the top five, 10 holdings if you can get your hands on them, because that tells you all you really need to know about the methodology that's gone into the creation of them and what they're actually focusing on. And a lot of the times you can weed them out based on that. I've seen ESG funds where it's in the top three holdings, ExxonMobil were, were there. So um, that tells you kind of it's just a branding and marketing exercise as opposed to a genuine fund that's kind of mm. been constructed for that reason. So it, it is prevalent, but I think in five years time, there'll be much more standards around what you can call yourself and those funds won't be able to do that anymore. 
And more transparency, I, I would imagine, Rob. I mean, something that I've seen and heard a lot over the last 10, 15 years is demands for more transparency in pension funds, for example. Is, is that something that you're seeing? There is more transparency in, in funds generally, not just ESG ones. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly with this type of fund, you'd expect a good level of transparency and you'd be um, well advised to look at the top 10 holdings at a minimum, really. I mean, you know, I'd be surprised if you couldn't see the whole portfolio, at least a snapshot of it, even if it's a historic one. Yeah, that's a good point. How do you find that? I mean, let, let's go step by step. So say, for example, I'm on Charles Stanley website. How do I then actually find that list and, and actually find out what's in a particular fund? There's a fund fact sheet on the website. So you just go to that and the top 10 holdings are listed. So if that doesn't pass a, a sort of sense check in terms of kind of how you want to invest, then you can obviously reject that fund. Certainly there are funds out there that don't necessarily meet people's needs. And we always say, well, you need to check whether it actually does, because just buying something because it has a certain label doesn't necessarily give you give you what you want and align with your own values. Mm, quite. And then the other thing that always bothers me about ESG is that quite a lot of the things that are you know, quite genuinely labelled green sometimes look rather worse than the extraction industry. So, for example, biomass energy, that's something that I find quite worrying, frankly. Do we know, Tom, what kinds of energy, for example, these funds are investing in? Because, you know, me personally, I wouldn't want to invest in something that dealt with biomass, for example, and a few others I'm not keen on. Yeah, and me too, really. So I, I think it's, it's again, it's about that digging beneath the label because you, you could end up with a sustainable or renewable energy fund, which is full of stuff that you actually want to avoid. So it's that little bit of extra, unfortunately, like homework for the general retail investor to do. I think, again, there'll be more standards around this and there'll be much more stringent terminology you can use in the future. But right now, you have to do that initial bit of digging in order to get the fund and invest in the way that you want to invest. Yeah. Can you explain to me how ticker works? Because we're talking to, to people from two sort of different types of companies. So Charles Stanley is a very long established investment house, has an uh, investment platform, but ticker is quite a new app. How long have you been going and what, what do you actually do, Tom? Yeah, so we're approaching two years since our first uh, family and friends were experimented on in the product. Um, so there's really three stages in signing up. You select a theme that you want to invest in, people, planet, or people and planet, as I uh, discussed before, and then a risk level, high, medium, and low. And then you can choose to invest in an ISA, GIA, or JISA, and we're actually bringing out SIPs. And in the background, you're invested in hundreds of listed uh, businesses around the world that are linked to the theme that you've selected through their business model. So we invest in companies ranging from education companies to renewable energy companies like we just discussed, mainly wind and solar, across the spectrum basically. And there's probably 10 or so key areas that we invest in around the world. And people can start from, from five pounds. Thankfully for us, they invest more than that on an average <laughs> basis. People are investing about 200 or 250 pounds a month. And the demographic of the customer is quite interesting. It's 31 years old on average. It's a gender neutral kind of customer base 50-50, as I said before, 90% have never invested before. So it's kind of engaging a new demographic in, in investing. And important to, to flag, it's not a trading product. We're, um, we're trying to promote sustainable in the non-climate sense uh, investing. So the, the core kind of model is our customers invest about £200 every month and 85% of our customers invest the same amount each month on a rolling basis. Mm. So yeah, that's, the, that, that's who we are and, and what we do in a nutshell. And do you use open banking? Are you one of those that sort of sweeps money in or, or they actually definitely have to say it's just £200 and here's my standing order kind of thing? It's a, it's a good question because we do use open banking. We don't use it for that purpose yet, but we will do. As it stands at the moment, the customers kind of opt for the amount that they invest. In about six months' time, we'll start calculating what, the, what we think they can do as well. Mm -hmm. We do a couple of other things in the product, which is we calculate our customers' carbon footprint based on how much they spend and where they spend it. And we also recommend them more sustainable places to spend their money. For example, if they have a British gas bill, we recommend them Bulb as an energy alternative. Mm -hmm. the, the idea with the platform is you invest in the, in the solutions to the problems you care about, which is good for you and good for everyone else. And we make your consumption as impactful as it possibly can be via spending better and offsetting the rest. Mm, handy. So it's the sort of all, all the way around. And um, Rob, with Charles Stanley, you, you have the opportunity to invest in individual companies that, that you like the look of, as well as actual ESG funds, don't you? 
Yeah, so it's a full service DIY platform, which basically means you can buy any share. A subset of the funds are going to be, um, you know, some of the funds that we've talked about in terms of their ESG credentials or, or, or socially responsible credentials. There's obviously thousands of funds available, and we realize that's not particularly helpful for, for people who are, who are starting out, although it's ideal for people who know exactly what they want. So we do have a, a section of the website where we break down some of the jargon surrounding the area. And we've got lots of information there, but ultimately it does come down to people's own views and own choices. But we're just trying to get people to read as much as they can and keep informed. Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, it does take a while. Not everybody wants to do it. So guys, before we leave, would you let me know what you personally think are good funds, good things to invest in? Anything that you particularly are investing in in the ESG and impact area? Tom, tell me what you're thinking of. Well, I obviously exclusively use ticker uh, for of my course. own personal money. I have, <laughs> I, I have to. Um, but I think even if we didn't exist, I'd be searching for something like this. And I think there are some very, very credible funds out there outside of ticker that are designed to address specifically impact invested and embed really, really good ESG principles. And I think even though it's difficult to navigate the waters, it's never been easier in terms of finding out what companies and funds are genuine. And I think they're quite well labeled on most of the brokerage platforms now, if that's the way people invest. How about you, Rob? I'm sure you only buy yours on Charles Stanley, of course. Yes, naturally. And <laughs> <laughs> no, no surprises. No so surprises. it's no, no investment advice intended here, by the way. No, <laughs> just, just interested in you personally, your, yeah. what, you, what you personally like. So, yes, some of the options that we, we have highlighted recently. Bailey Gifford, Positive Change has been a really interesting holding, mm -hmm. but that is genuinely a really interesting fund. And in terms of its sort of performance potential and, you know, the fact that, that it produces impact reports and has a genuine approach to, to this area. And another, another one that we added recently, actually, was Schroeder Global Energy Transition, which is all about the, um, the transition from a, a sort of high carbon world to, to a very low carbon world. Um, the electrification across industry. So, so that's another high risk fund to take a look at. But another mm. one that I, I should probably point out for, for somebody who wants something a lot lower risk would be Threadneedle Social Bond, which is a so social impact bond fund. Oh, that's lovely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. that really interesting ideas there. Thanks so much to both Tom McGillicuddy and Rob. Thank you so much for, for everything that you've explained to us. Rob Morgan from Charles Stanley. And Ticker is available on all, all of the platforms, is it, Tom? Yeah, iOS and Android, yeah. Great. Well, thank you both for all of that. And uh, don't forget to look on moneymagpie.com for our articles on investing, including ESG investing. And if you're not already, make sure you do follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle, of course, is at moneymagpie. And you can follow me too on Twitter at Jasmine and on Instagram at Jasmine Bertels. If there's a particular subject you'd like us to cover on the podcast, just let us know on Money Magpie message boards. We'd love to get your ideas. Today's episode was presented by myself, Jasmine Bertels, and the producer was Jenny Bertels. Mm -hmm.